Welcome to the Africa podcast. We have another episode of the Outline series. Today on the series, we have artist and arts activist Marianne Peters, who is an artist who's combined studio work, installations, public art projects, and art activism, which has made a noted contribution to the Northwest of the United States and nationally over 30 years, for over 30 years. Most recently, uh, Marianne's work has focused on the overlap of contemporary events with splintered histories in the Middle East, which is why I'm so excited to welcome Marianne to the series. Welcome. Thank you. I'm, I'm happy to be here. It's fun when I get to interview somebody who has been a, uh, you know, a very active Africa member for, <laughs> for quite some time. <laughs> so it's really, really fun to um, be able to to talk to somebody who's been such a big supporter for so long. Well, you've, you've sort of become my university. Uh, <laughs> it's been a way for me to become informed in, in topics and, and in approaches that I would never not necessarily know about. So it's been great yeah. for me. So I want to ask you, um, the byline, artist and artist, art activist, what does that mean? And what does it mean to you? Well, for me, it means that I wear multiple hats as an artist. I'm not just a producer of objects, that I also am invited to make commentary on cultural events or uh, even historical events that affect artists in particular. So an example would be I worked for 10 years on First Amendment rights and um, the arts, and that was a project that was intercepting basically censorship of artists based on their subject matter. So I, I get pulled into various circumstances, I think partially because I'm comfortable chasing down um, the crux of the matter and articulating it in public. It's not because I'm more uh, versed at the topic than somebody else, but it's been a, a place for me to be active outside my studio. Yeah. When... You know, when people think about, or I won't even talk about people, when I think about the visual arts, I have a very specific um, sort of image of what that sort of looks like. Mm -hmm. um, and what we have on the screen here isn't, isn't the first thing that comes to mind for my right. like fifth grader, fifth grader brain. Um, right. What did you think you were getting yourselves, yourself into when you decided to become an artist? Oh, I had an entirely different concept of what it meant to be an artist. I thought I would use it more in social services and the more traditional notions of social services. But as it turns out, I have been using it socially and uh, actively in, and again, in circumstances that I wouldn't have been able to identify when I first launched what I considered to be my career as an artist. I, I, I always had I hand coordination. I was the kid in the class that could draw anything. And, um, but I didn't understand that there was a full profession to do that. And going to graduate school and being around other artists that were much more sophisticated in their development than I was, um, was the beginning of me understanding that in essence, there's no rules. It, yeah. it, it's more that you have a way of identifying a topic and, illuminating it for someone beside yourself. And that's kind of the, the crux of the problem is finding something that captivates you, that you feel you have the skill base to bring into fruition and then launch it um, kind of through the seam of a public eye and people that you may never meet. And it's, it's an awkward, but kind of exhilarating uh, position to be in. And I just, have been doing it a long time. And what you're seeing on the screen is really an unusual, uh, but it fits. Um, but I, I don't know if we want to talk about it further, but I've been doing a whole series of installations called Impossible Monuments. Mm -hmm. And I identif identify those as events or incidents that I locate in histories, mainly tied to the Arab world and how they in some way affect a larger topic and would never be elevated to the, to the position of a monument. They would never be honored in that manner. And this was, uh, I was given an artist residency in a building 
and Seattle that I was in between studios and I had read an article about uh, the unfortunate contraband businesses on the coast of the Mediterranean that were selling uh, inflatables that actually would not float like life jackets and boats. And so I just decided to do a kind of an, I'd have to say a meditation, an homage to people that unknowingly lost their lives uh, by purchasing faulty products. And also just thinking about how um, unrest, civil unrest and war zones propagate some unexpected activations by people that that are not necessarily honorable. And yeah. uh, the, the piece was called Impossible Monument, Nothing But the Memory. And it was in in the end, it was about 30 feet long. And it was just these florets, these dozens and well, hundreds and hundreds of florets that were embedded around uh, discarded life jacket parts and backpack parts and clothing parts. And that's, that's what I'm saying. Just to close the loop in my head. So this, these were, um, these were faulty or this was, this was sort of like uh, negligence or. um, It was, it was, they, they are um, sanctioned businesses that, Mm might have been something else. They might have been not making any money doing anything. And then there was this influx of, of migrants trying to get across the Mediterranean and somebody initiated, um, and I don't know who, um, products that were not built to be viable flotation devices to cross the Mediterranean. But oh, wow. if you if you come from someplace where you have no seagoing knowledge or that you wouldn't know how to investigate. I mean, I mean, in the urgency of trying to get from point A to point B, I think people unknowingly purchased these products and I just stumbled onto this. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's amazing. It actually like is a really, really poignant reminder of our priorities. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Um, I want to I want to ask you another question, which is, um, when somebody says to you, "Okay, so you're based in Seattle, you've done a bunch of stuff in the Northwest," what is your the nature of your interest in the Middle East? Um, how do you tell that story? I think I know what it is, but how do you tell that story? <laughs> That's such a good question. Um, well, I, my, my family is Lebanese. Um, I was raised in a Lebanese American family and I've always had the backdrop of my cultural ties in the most kind of sentimental ways. And I just felt that I needed to be better informed. And I, I won an award that uh, not only gave me the, the recognition, but it gave me money And I went to Beirut and I did a residency in Beirut and I had a chance to do research there and to talk to people there and to, in some ways, I hope, give myself more leverage to be a spokesperson as a second generation Arab American with a name that nobody would recognize as being from the Arab world to be part of the commentary. And I've tried very hard to make work that would not necessarily come into um, the menu of subject matter that is already being produced. And uh, to give it in, I think my, one of my secondary intentions is to start conversations. Mm. I'm not a scholar. I, I, I basically feel that I, that the timing was right for me to um, well, to own my heritage in a public way within my artwork. I'd always used non-Western influences for ideas in my work, but I just felt that this was so topical. And of course there were events that were happening all over the world, gosh, from, oh, endlessly. Uh, But I have to say one of the first incidents that triggered me was when Timothy McVeigh blew up the the courthouse in Oklahoma city 
And the first communities that were assaulted were people from those of Arab descent. And people don't know that, you know, and, and yeah. so anyway, so there were things like this that I kept bumping into, you know, and I, I thought, and then the Arab Spring happened and I had gone to Lebanon finally as just a visitor in 2010. And, um, and I thought this, this, this is a massive, potentially huge movement. And of course, like many felt sad at the collapse where it collapsed. Um, but I think it's because people just don't have access to enough information about this really vital part of the world. And it was time for me to throw my hat in the ring. Yeah. yeah. It's really, really interesting. So, um, you know, this whole series outline is supposed to be focused on process. Um, and it's usually, we try to center it around some specific project, but you and I had spoken before and there isn't a, like a single specific project. So I, I'd love to sort of think about the practice, uh, the process behind your practice more broadly. Sure. Um, and that you were, you were mentioning right before we started that there was like, like a couple sort of different frameworks or uh, prisms or buckets to sort of think about when thinking about, uh, about your practice. Um and maybe that's like a good place to start. And then we can sort of start thinking about sort of the before, during, and after of different projects and pieces. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Well, um, so what's the question? <laughs> so like, what, it, what are those, what are those buckets? Like, what are those, uh, those frameworks? Like help me understand the way you approach specific projects. Like okay. you can start with the, the Middle Eastern one or, the, the okay. stuff that we have on the screen right now, just like okay. how do you typically approach a new a new a project? Okay, well, the, what you're looking at on the screen right now is a piece called Traveler, mm -hmm. and it's part of a series that I've done ca called Storyboard. And a storyboard is in theater uh, the parts; it's the elements that are tied together to make a singular story. And it's also a word that's used in uh, war tactics. And I just, the idea of theater. And I just thought, I want to see if I can imagine making a group of images that would be akin to a field reporter. So I make them quickly. I choose my uh, subjects from a variety of places. This one is actually from an archived image that I found that's from the 19th century but I've also used images from Doctors Without Borders. I've used images from online postings just by citizens on the street. I've, uh, in fact, the, the painting that's behind me is Storyboard One. And that's a composite of street incidents that I invented an image off of. And I find that the storyboards are a way for someone to know that there are these tendrilled events that actually tie into someone who's in a forced migration. And that's the kind of the bottom line of the, of the series. So does the idea come first? Like, does it sort of unfold the way you just described it? Oh, theater of war, storyboard, theater. Um, I like these ideas and they need to be sort of sketchy the same way storyboards are sketchy. Does it sort of unfold in that exact way? It, it that's it does closely unfold yeah. that way because what I'm well aware of the whole time is that this is not my story. This is my witnessing mm. of a story that deserves some sort of reverence and some elevation in the conversation of contemporary events. So I try to be respectful of the topic, but also to find a topic that has depth. Because while I'm doing it, I'm also researching, I'm learning myself what is happening in various places and how it's happening as opposed to the kind of popular notion of how something is happening. And I've, in the art world, there is a broad sweep of the idea of multiculturalism that we are um, by nature, uh, the United States is a conglomerate of multiple nations and multiple cultural orientations. But 
you don't as frequently see gestures from people who are tied to the Arab world. And it's kind of one of those, I'd have to say, disappointments that I try to not use that as the reason for making the work, but understand it as one reason to make the work is to add to a, a, a fuller menu of what it means to be multicultural in the arts in America. Yeah. Is there a big Arab American community in the Northwest? Oh, very good. You know, there is a pretty good uh, sized community of people and Crazily, I've had a hard time really making connections with mm. them. Um, I I think in some ways there's a more, especially as an artist. I mean, they some people know my work uh, and have seen my exhibitions, but I think there's a more sentimentalized notion of what an art artistic contribution should be. Yeah. So if you go to the Arab festivals, for example the arts component tend to be craft or um, illustrative and uh, gestures that I'm, I'm certainly, I'm, I, I don't make illustrations. I, I use illustrations to expand on, but that's not my skill. And, and so I, 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 to my dismay, I confess that I don't know as many people as I wish I did yeah. in the area. Yeah. It's, you know, th this is part of my, like my issue with, you know, Id identity more broadly. Um, yeah. And you and I have talked about this and I talk about it all the time with, with Africa, yeah. but like um, that, like a piece like this wouldn't necessarily immediately be thought of as being a part of this sort of Arab yeah. art canon uh, right. because it's, it doesn't have st specific stylistic, you know, characteristics that people want to see to reaffirm to, to reaffirm that you know um, right it must be frustrating i mean i would be frustrated i'm frustrated <laughs> about it it must be frustrating for you right it is but i you know one of the things i've done uh which is not it's more common now i'd have to say but in all my exhibitions i always have explanations of the sources of my images Hmm. So that if somebody wants to ask me more about it, they can. And I always do talks because um, that's where I learn what people really think is going on or where they feel that there are holes in the discussion. And like in this instance, this is actually um, a photograph that I found that's a contemporary image that was on the, the web of what's called... Um, what it's like slash burning. It's a tactic. It's a war tactic where you burn the food you burn. The, so this was a wheat field at one time, Wow! but it's a beautiful image. And my source was beautiful. And that the piece is called field. And I think that that's enough. You know, I think that somebody can understand that something happened there and that there was at one time a vital landscape that has been reduced to this. And uh, then it's up to me or that person, hopefully, to have enough curiosity to know where I got this, why I would make it. Yeah. Um, it? Yeah, yeah, no, it absolutely answers it. I, I find, I mean, I, I'm always moved by, by your work. Um, who were some of the, the early influences for you? Oh my gosh, that, that's, that's a great question. Well, I have to credit Robbie, Marue for having a conversation with me after I saw Pixelated Universe. And he was uh, doing a, a performance here in Seattle and I was um, hosting some food for him and was talking to him. And I asked him how he got that footage. I just presumed that the sources for the footage was by going to Syria. And he said, I, I can't go to Syria. And I said, well, how are you pulling the images? He goes, well, I can find the images. And, and I said, well, then how do you make a decision to act on them? And he said, because I'm interested and I want to. And I thought, well, I'm interested and I want to. And so he kind of gave me unknowingly permission to 
take a chance on focusing my work in a culturally specific way. Uh, I think I, I know that the Northwest community of which I have a long standing was kind of surprised by my decision because I had a very full career as a painter. Uh, but I just thought I have nothing to lose and yeah. this is important. So, so Robbie uh, would be, thank you. Thank you. Um, my sister and brother and my family uh, are both activists. My sister in particular is an activist and has been for many, many years in radio in California. She had one of the longest running uh, public access programs called Third World News that would dissect mainstream news and then expand upon it with guests uh, in, a, in a fuller fuller way. And mm. each of them has always been, I'd have to say, cheerleaders for me. My parents probably wouldn't understand what I'm doing in the same way as my siblings do, mm. because they had a different purpose in as first generation, you know, they, they, it was all about assimilating for them. And, um, and, but, and the sentiment, I mean, I think they would steadfastly say that they are Lebanese. And of course, now I've done enough research to go, well, maybe, you know, <laughs> <laughs> they, they, they're from Mount Lebanon, they, there, it was Syria, you know what I mean? So I learned these yeah. things and I think, well, does it matter how much we shake the myths in within our families about that part of the world and our ties to it? Is it, is that affection, does that affection need to be intercepted with some sort of new facts that I don't know. It's kind of a dilemma for me, but uh, I think about it. Yeah. I mean, I wonder, I mean, I feel like when it comes to family stories, I feel like we just replace one myth with another. Exactly. You know, kind of. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, um, I, I want to ask you this question that um, I don't know the actual answer. I love names. Names matter to me a lot. Uh -huh. um, and so this whole sort of project that's centering around the Middle East, um, do you have a name for it? And is it the, was it the first name um, that you came up with? Oh, you know, I don't think I have a name for it. I have an intention for it. Yeah, what's the intention? <laughs> Well, the intention is to participate in a in a topic and a historical perspective that is valuable and that I have the skill base to do it and to join in a community, a global community that I I don't know you know that I would like to know. And you know, again, uh, we've talked about this a little bit, but as someone whose family name was anglicized, it puts you in an entirely different uh, channel of, of opportunity. And people, mm -hmm. until I started making this work, I would have to say no, the majority of people did not know anything about my heritage or my ties. And uh, it's up to me to change that. So it doesn't have a name per se. Uh, I mean, it has series. There are series that people could follow if they wanted to, like the storyboards or the impossible monuments. Uh, right now there are six or seven impossible monuments, which are temporary mm -hmm. uh, sculptural installations. I'm working on one right now um, for a show in Philadelphia. And um, I, I think that's, gosh, I'm rambling. I don't no, think no, 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 it's, it's beautiful. Cause it's <laughs> it, in many ways, it's like hearing you talk about it, it's, it's as if it's like, um, It's, it's almost like it's an access card, you know? Yeah. Yes. You're... I hope so. Yeah. Yeah. The, the very first kind of out the gate thing that I made is actually in one of the photos that you had in the beginning, which mm -hmm. is I, the first impossible monument were bronzed pita breads. 
And I was thinking that, that I'm holding them. And I was thinking about the most fundamental thing. What is the most ubiquitous fundamental thing that people identify as being from the Middle East? And it's bread. Yeah. Pita bread. But uh, it would never, ever be considered a, uh, something with, that should rise up in the hierarchy of monuments for sure. And I bronze them because bronze is the material of monuments yeah. and they can be passed around. And in my experience of showing them and passing them around, there's a visceral reaction that I wouldn't have anticipated in the conceptual state of this. So when I saw that this little tiny gesture, this little tiny sculptural piece had such language and mileage to it, I just took off with the, these ideas around impossible monuments. So the next one I did was yeah. a, a, you know, a full floor length, uh, a full-sized large carpet, 13 by 17 feet that was made out of baking pot, a baking flour that was thinking about that people, and I, I, I say people, I'm going to say the majority of observers wouldn't know that drought has played such a huge part in what has happened in the, in the Near East and that yeah. it's been ongoing. And so I, I made this piece that was temporary and shocking to folks because they thought it was solid and somebody walked into it and it of course dissipated and I, you know, had to repair it, but it was in a big exhibition and it just sort of launched my, it was my coming out about, I'm going to start making work in earnest around Middle Eastern topics. And, yeah. um, and the piece was called Impossible Monument on My Eyes and My Head, which I explained to people was, with the help of a translator, was from uh, an expression that basically in Arabic would mean I would do anything for you. Mm. And that was benevolent, that it was a, a generous gesture. And so it, it's, yeah. I, I find myself just... Uh, every time I try something, I learn something I wouldn't have known. And it, it gives me um, pause sometimes because there's a responsibility. I know right now when I'm talking to you, I'm thinking there's all these people listening to me that are thinking she doesn't know what she's talking about. And yeah. they might be right. And, and, but that vulnerability is not a bad thing for me. It's, it's more of a, Oh, I'd have to say it's a kick in the pants to keep going. But it's also it's also a beautiful thing because it is such a uh, it's such a relatable quality. I am sure there are people who come out of the um, the woodwork all the time saying, "Oh my God, I, I totally relate to you." <laughs> oh, I'm glad. I'm glad. And you know, sometimes like the piece you have on the screen right now is called Nightingale. And uh, I, 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 I just kind of came out of nowhere. I made this little painting and it was partially because when I was in Beirut, I was looking, I found another artist's work that had, it was a photograph of people, these men that were in a raft that were trying to cross the Mediterranean and they had um, collaged onto them birds uh, on their shoulders. And I thought, what is that? Well, it turns out that nightingales are a hopeful symbol, that mm. there's something that is considered a protector and in, in many cultures, not just aligned with the Near East, but I just thought, oh, how beautiful. So I made this image of something that there's a calamity of sorts, but there's guardians, there's these nightingale guardians. Yeah. So I want to ask you a question. You said that um, there was this moment where you decided to start making this work and sort of uh, depart from your, your, you know, your skills as a, as a painter. Yes. Right. 
So did it feel all, like all of a sudden you're like writing with your left hand all of a sudden, like, you know, you have to like express yourself with like, I don't know how to do this. This is still me, but it's not me. I don't have the skills I need. Yeah. Um, it's more that I didn't have the information that I need. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I have the skills. I mean, I, I painting now comes is second nature to me. I, yeah. I feel fortunate that I can paint or draw pretty much anything I think about, but I had been working mainly abstractly. I had been making mm -hmm. work that was more referential in an abstract way and to start making work that actually had image associations that were legible broadly uh, felt a little scary. Uh, yeah. And I, I think that I, um, my first concern was that I'd be found out to be an imposter <laughs> and somebody would say she doesn't really know what she's talking about. And so I had to, whenever I chose an image source, I had to, as best I could find out as much as I possibly could about it so that I would be in a position of, if not saying this is what this thing is about, I could say, if you want to know more about this, you can look in this place or yeah. follow this in and uh, it made me be working so in a solitary way inside of a community and well yeah, yeah i mean one of the things though is it's interesting is that um is that i feel like you're operating w with the intention to not conceal the d the degree to which she you feel like an imposter <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and that honesty and that humility and transparency is so refreshing because usually people who feel like an imposter have a chip on their shoulder. Um, and, and they are, you know, stomping their feet and saying, no, 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 no I, I'm the real deal, you know? Right. And right. they don't usually have this like humility and, um, and, and present with such transparency of like, I'm trying to figure this out. <laughs> And will you all help me? <laughs> help. Um, well, you know, I, I mean, the bottom line task is to be authentic in no yeah. matter what it is that you do. And in, so what I wanted to be sure of is that my connection to my choices were, were ones that I could, in some facet of my history, including, I mean, I'm, I'm world traveled. I'm lucky. I've traveled a lot. And yeah. um, that I have seen things that I, are kindred. And so it wasn't that they were completely alien to me, the choices I was making in these images. Mm -hmm. Sometimes what I, well, the most purpose, purposeful thing I would be doing is I'm not copying what I'm seeing. I am translating what I'm seeing in a visual way that hopefully will spark curiosity for somebody who sees it. So the image mm. that's on the screen right now is a composite. It's partially from a photograph of a skirmish on um, a street where somebody's running away and a canopy that was collapsed uh, in Tripoli in Lebanon. I went to Tripoli and was walking through the souk there and this beautiful canopy dropped down. And I just thought this, this juxtaposition, it could be really beautiful because yeah. it's about the domesticity of a place being disrupted. There's something that somebody would use all the time is collapsing into the street. And I, I you know, I think too, Mikey, I, I, I have, I think a lot about, ethics. I think, is this an ethical image for me to make? Mm -hmm. And by that, I mean, is, is anybody going to be hurt by my choice? There's um, like a Hippocratic oath that you have to take. Yeah. I, I personally have to take. Mm. So for example, sometimes because I've made so many works that were tied to incidents and disruptions inside of um, Lebanon or Syria or other countries in the region that are being challenged, I think a lot about whether or not I put a person in there. Because if I, if I can do it, 
I mean, the traveler, I thought, was a generous image. It looked like that person had strength. They were walking away through a landscape, and um, that that felt like a worthy thing for me to do. But in general, I really am aware that somebody is suffering in some of the choices of images that I've pulled, and that I need to be aware of that. Um, I, I did a whole series, which we haven't pulled any images. Oh, maybe have one in here that's called uh, This Trembling Turf. And it's a black and white drawing. They're great big pieces. There's 10 of them. I did them over the course of six years, five years. And they were based on a pretty horrible thing, uh, incident that I stumbled onto when I was in Beirut about a mass grave. And I thought, well, nobody will verify for me that this exists. Uh, the majority of people probably in, in a quieter exchange might say, oh yes, there is, this exists. But I couldn't find it in, in a sanctioned, in sanctioned information. So I thought, okay, well, what else can I do with this idea? Uh, I can go to the place that throughout the world there are incidents that have buried histories that nobody wants anybody to know about. Mm -hmm. So I did a whole group of them called This Trembling Turf. This one is called This Trembling Turf, The Waters. And it's just saying underneath our feet, beneath our feet, there is a tale to be told that is, has been dismissed or subjugated or uh, disappeared. And you never, you can't get away. From, I mean, we live with the scars of things like this. Yeah. And, but I didn't feel that I, uh, am I going to go paint a picture of a mass grave? No. Not yeah. Going to do that. yeah. Can I ask you the, about the, um, the sort of emotional journey of putting something like this together. Sure. Like what does, you know, I, I can personally imagine what it feels like to write a essay about something so heavy and, or to write a song about something so heavy. And I can think about the emotional toll and just cause I'm closer to that world. I can't, I don't know what the, it would feel like to put together a huge, um, a huge visual, like work in a visual medium and be going the extra mile to sort of abstract, um, you know, abstract it out, out of care. Right. 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 What does that do to you emotionally? Well, I, I, you know, of course it's heart wrenching, but then it's also like that the, You've been given an opening, Marianne, you've been given an opening to draw attention to something that's global and that you're interested in and that no one else has approached in quite the same way. Mm -hmm. So what I ended up doing was researching forensic anthropology and how things are found underground and the tools that are used that pulse like a sonogram and that to understand that all over the world, someone is trying to recover information around humanity that has been dismissed or hidden. And that that's a good thing that, yeah. that I'm contributing. And that's a good thing. And so I, I painted them in, well, they're drawings actually, but I drew them in such a way that they're large enough that the viewer stands in front of them as if they too are underground. They're like cross sections underground or underwater. Mm. And just to give that intention or uh, influence of subject matter to, to have a viewer try to imagine something like that. Yeah. And, but I, I find that, um, you know, there's there's no shortage of heartbreak. You know, we can find it in anything. But if I make something beautiful, it 
it gives that topic, I hope, another layer, another layer of consideration. And that's my intention for sure. But I can't, can I experience what I'm talking about like you would experience it? No way. I'm yeah, sure. but by the same token, I kind of experience the way you are. Yeah. And yeah. the crazy part of this story, which we, you know, I couldn't get over it, was I was looking at a book at the Arab Image Foundation in Beirut, mm -hmm. which was an amazing source. And yeah. in this book, there was a paragraph that was maybe three sentences long about this un, un, of unofficially corroborated story. And of this mass grave. Yes. Yeah. And, um, and I just thought, what in the world? How could it be three sentences buried in a book? Well, because it's shameful, partially, and because it's contentious, partially, and because it's painful, you know, and it involved... Uh, it was a mass grave under a golf course and the only golf course in Beirut. And so if you know where that is, then you know the affiliated communities around there and that it was tied to uh, incidents in, in the camps, in the Palestinian camps. And just, you know, it just is a piece of history that will be a wound. And yeah. so... I, I just thought, Mary, I'm not, a, I'm not in a position to literally talk about this. So I did it in an indirect way. Have you, have any of these uh, works been displayed or been exhibited in, in the Middle East, in Lebanon specifically? None. Mm -mm. They have not. Have you thought, I mean, uh, uh, clearly you've thought about it, or, but... Um, <laughs> Well, now they're all in collections, which is very interesting that every single one of them, the other 10, are now dispersed in, in collections. Of the, this trembling turf. This trembling turf. But I, oh, my dream is to show my work in the Middle East. Are you kidding? I mean, yeah. of course, but um, it's just this, having this conversation with you makes me feel like, oh, um, I am, I, I could be some I could contribute <laughs> in yeah. that way. And who knows, maybe something will happen. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I feel like, I feel like you're trying to talk to, to this community specifically. <laughs> I am. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> yeah. I am. It's so true. Um, I am, um, you know, and, and I, um, and part of the dilemma is, as you alluded to earlier, is being worthy inside of um, people who are intimately connected. I, mm -hmm. I will always be a distanced observer because uh, that's the era I was born into. Yeah. Uh, and I, I don't know how to get around it any other way. Yeah. Um, there's a question that we like to ask, which is like, who are the you know, five, I we always say five unlisted co-founders, but really it's people who um, directly influence this work, uh, directly or indirectly influence this work yes. that may not even be aware. I mean, you, you know, you could have oh, met them, but they, they just are, they're unaware that their DNA is all over this project. Right. Right. Who are some of those people? Some of those people are Doctors Without Borders who are doing things in the world that people have no idea that they're doing. I, I did a piece in honor of a nurse that I met from Doctors Without Borders at an, an Arab um, festival conference that he had been stationed in Yemen and Yemeni fishermen were coming to Doctors Without Borders to ask them to help them um, respectfully retrieve the belongings and the losses in the Mediterranean from people trying to cross the Mediterranean. So I made a piece in honor of 
having met this person called Impossible Monument Flotsam. And it was just about an unsuspecting fisherman being out on the waters and pulling in the detritus of someone's loss on the Mediterranean. Mm -hmm. So this person, they don't know that I did this. Doctors Without Borders doesn't know that I did this. I have pulled some of their photographs um, and used them as sources. And it, I, as an artist, you have to be really, of course, careful. He, I mean, you can't, I can't, I would never copy. <laughs> yeah. So, but I can use them as sources. So I'd have to say Doctors Without Borders. All the incredible, um, nervy street photographers, people that are just throwing things up on the web. Of course, it's, it's anything you see that way, you have to understand it as a piece of the story. You know, people are putting yeah. up what they want you to see. Well, I'm putting up what I want you to see. So like this image that's in front of us right now is, again, a composite from multiple photographs that the original image was, a, I can't, it might have been a Doctors Without Borders, but it was a hospital that had been mm -hmm. destroyed. And I just took it at, it's called Way Station, and I just took it apart, I took the landscape apart and reconstructed it to be a possible landscape you were seeing, would see if you were moving on foot to try to get from point A to point B. And, um, and I, I'm trying to, um, so I'm trying to, uh, what would be the word? Do composites of the courage of people within with in the Middle East and outside of it who are trying to break out from sanctioned accounts of what's happening in a place. And that's that seems to be a worthy thing to do. And yeah. so that's so yeah, I wish I could meet some of these folks that are just, you know, they're down on the street taking photos. Um, who else? There's other artists that I would like to talk to someday. And I've followed some of the artists that you've had on your, your uh, show. And I'm just grateful to hear them, you know, to yeah. know that they're making this work. Uh, I, you know, I'm trying not to just be um, pointing out all that's so sad. <laughs> I'm trying, yeah. you know, I'm trying not to do that uh, because that's, the, tr the truth of it is that sadness is, is it's part of the menu of what's happening in a place. But yeah. I just feel it, you know, Mikey, I, I, I feel like it's my responsibility to, to if, I, if I can in some way grab some piece of unexpected information and give it a visual presence, then I should do that. So, so. Have you had any any sort of pushback from people? I mean, you're so you're so nervous and so um, careful with every single step to make sure that you're not, um, you know, talking out of school or right. overstepping. Is that because you have overstepped and somebody you know slapped your wrist and said, "Hey, hey, this is not your this is not your your place," or is it just totally in your in your head? <laughs> I think it's probably in my head a little bit more than anything, but I, uh, that the, the interesting part for me, the challenge for me right now is to, uh, to get, and I don't know, I don't want to um, dwell on it, but I'm trying to get museum structures, larger institutions um, outside of academia to take a chance on my work um, I'm trying to uh, hear that somebody could come along and say, you don't know what you're talking about and, uh, and be able to have enough ego strength to correct it. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm trying to do that. I rarely have conversations with other artists that are from the Arab world. I basically, my, <laughs> my audience is not from that part of the world. Yeah. And so that's, that's been kind of, it's not, it doesn't make me sad. It just makes me realize 
how hard it is to find your footing. And I think you're absolutely right identifying that I'm nervous about what if somebody, what if I really actually played in that swimming pool? You know, what yeah. would happen? Uh, but in the long and short of it, the work that I make, even though sometimes the subject matter is troublesome, is quite beautiful. And I'm relying on that to be the entree yeah. in some way. Yeah. And I mean, the other, the other thing is that, you know, when I was reading your bio, I, I, part of the reason why it was such a short bio is that because if I start listing the number of awards you've won, it's just going to, it's going <laughs> to take, it's going to take me a long time to get through them. Well, so it's interesting. For... <laughs> it, it is interesting though, that, that, um, you know, this sort of like this new chapter. Um, okay. I want to talk a little bit about um, the, the, what you see is coming next. And for this like broader, broader intention. Um, and do these projects end? I mean, like, does the storyboard project have an ending and then you kind of move on from it? Or is it just like this recurring, you know, uh, place to explore? Yeah, I think the storyboards can go on and on and on because history is unfolding as we speak. Yeah. So there's always going to be a resource. The Trembling Turfs, I stopped making. I, I stopped them at 10 I don't know why I stopped them, except for that I thought I don't want to make a shtick out of this. I want this to be a, a you know, um, what would you, a body of work that has a narrative that circles the globe, and that that's enough. Crazily, it's one of the easiest series I've made. I've felt completely comfortable making them, and so that's a question to ask myself: Why would I stop making something that feels so comfortable? Um, um, and it's, and it's partially my own, uh, ethic as an artist. I feel like I should go to the thing I don't know. I should just keep going to the thing I don't know. So, yeah. um, I forgot what the original question was. <laughs> I'm sure it'll come back to me though. Yeah. Just, uh, in terms of like, uh, in next steps after this, um, yes. what, what comes next after this? Well, I'm doing one more of the impossible monuments right now. And yeah, I think we've even talked about this, but it's based on the silk factory girls of Mount mm. Lebanon. And it's, I'm doing a, an impossible monument called the, the threads that bind. And it's, I've been wanting to make this for so long and way too long because the other pieces that I've done in that series, I've done quickly and been invited to do them and had not as much time as I've had this time with this work. But what has really been pulling me to do this piece is, and I, I think you're kind of going to love this story, but I called my elder aunt one day just to chat with her. And she asked me what I was doing. And I said, well, I'm working on this project. I've, I, I'm, it's a, a, it's about these young women in Mount Lebanon who were in the silk industry and a labor movement that they initiated that literally changed the economy of Lebanon or Syria, Ottoman Turk Syria at that time. And I'm just been captivated by it. And she said, well, you know, your great grandfather was a silk farmer. And on my dad's, my grandfather's, deathbed, I walked into the room and he was laying in the bed with his hands in the air, fiddling with something. And I asked my mom what he was doing. And she said, well, he's unraveling silk cocoons. And I just thought, okay, that, that, I don't know if my great grandfather is talking to me from the grave, but I have to do this project. And now it's become a little bit conspicuous for me because I, I, the ancestors are shouting at me, you know, to talk about this story. And I kind of doubt that my great grandfather was a silk farm owner. He probably was able to rent land to grow mulberry trees and have a silk mm -hmm. industry. But I, I, I don't think he had that kind of cachet. 
Um, but I don't know that. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I don't know how big the farms, ha- I don't know much about the silk industry, actually the actual agriculture of it. I, it could have, you know, just been a small little grove as well. Yeah. You know, Except for that it was all along the mountaintop, all many, many villages for hundreds and hundreds of years. So yeah. that's got in to I, what I, of course, what I love about the story is that there are these feisty girls, somebody in the middle of them um, had the nerve to uh, negotiate with French managers that were in need of workers because they had a flight, a blight in France and they needed silk. And yeah. these girls said, mm-hmm. and you know, who helped me with that is Akram. Yeah. yeah. At, uh, at North uh, and, and CSU. Yes. So cool. I'm, I'm making that piece right now. And then I, um, I kind of feel like backing up and just drawing, just making a series of drawings that um, may or may not have some historical imperative. I, I don't, I don't know. I just have to get through this next project and we'll, we'll see. How long does that take? I mean, um, I mean, I'm, I'm very selfishly asking because I, I'm, I'm, I can't wait to see, see the progress. <laughs> Me either. Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this project is, uh, it has to be done by the middle of May because it's for an, ex- an exhibition at the University of Pennsylvania in the Arthur Ross Gallery that opens June 16th. So I need to just make my choices and make this work. And hopefully it'll be really beautiful and um, a little, con- you know, kind of a little disconcerting, but yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Do you, um, when you're not there, how, aside from the little artist prompt, um, how do people know all this sort of the background? Well, uh, I'll, I'll write something. Yeah. I'll, I'll write something. And I probably, will uh, be part of a conversation that they'll invite me to speak at when it opens. I think I'm not, that's not being confirmed. And uh, I'm also going to make a little painting that is from a historical photograph of the girls in, in a factory. I have not Amazing. been able to find photographs of the girls inside of the most of the factories they worked in, which were 16 by 20 foot. Yeah. Have you been to the Silk Museum in Lebanon? I didn't get there, no, but I've okay. corresponded with them. Yeah. Okay. So I guess you got to come back. Yeah, I guess I do. I'd like to. Yeah. Um, okay. I want to, before we move on, um, I want to ask you this question. Okay. What did you fundamentally misunderstand about this project when you started it? And by project, I mean shifting towards making works about the Arab world. Hmm. What did you fundamentally misunderstand? Not about necessarily the subject matter, but about the intention. Oh, I, I think probably what I misunderstood was how resonant the topic could be for people that know nothing about that part of the world. I, uh, I've, Every time I've made the projects and made the exhibitions and talked about why I'm making it and where the stories come from. And they're all, I mean, really, I'm just being a storyteller. And that people have been emotionally struck by it. And so it it I I hope that if nothing else, it just makes someone again be curious about world events that they think they are not a part of, I mean, we're totally a part of it, especially in the United States, given our Mm. questionable participation in in that part of the world. And I think um, the hardest part for me has been at times not understanding that the historical record that I'm reading was only the version from a dominant culture at the time. And yeah. So, you know, no wonder I can't, no, no wonder I can't find anything. I, I went to Mexico City because I knew that there was 
a huge Arab community there and in Mexico, but everything was under the Turks, right? Well, because the migration was during that time at the collapse of the Ottoman Turkish Empire and everybody in rarely was anybody identified as Syrian or Le, definitely not Lebanese. And so I just was naive as a researcher. Uh, and a lot of times um, I, what did I fundamentally misunderstand? I misunderstood that I couldn't be a valuable resource. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I hope, I hope that you have, um, I hope you can retire that, that notion. <laughs> okay. I'm doing it today. Yeah. Over. yeah ret retire that notion. Um, uh, before we wrap up, I want to ask you at least one of these, uh, um, one of the, two of the questions from the quick Q and A, which is what are you reading or watching these days? I'm, I'm curious. Oh my goodness. I'm reading a King Solver uh, novel uh, that I'm halfway through that I can't even remember the title of right now. That's, mm. um, and I'm, oh, that's embarrassing. Uh, watching. <laughs> I, I've watched every single Oscar nominated film. Okay. Um, did, you, did you like any of them? Were you any favorites? Yes. Any favorites? Oh, well, women talking was was a beautiful was film and tough. Uh, there, I mean, I, I, I loved everything, everywhere, all at once. I mean, I loved it. You have to watch it more than once, you know. Some of yeah. and, and the beauty of 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 well, not for probably for filmmakers, but of streaming is that you can see something more than once and yeah. uh, easily. And so there's that. What are you reading? I read far too many New York Times articles. And <laughs> yeah. And, cool. Yeah. So it's a mix. Okay. Magazines, not, yeah. Okay. Then the, the, the other one I want to ask you is who would you love to shadow for a day, past or present? Oh, wow. Who would I love to shadow for a day? Whoa, that is such a hard question. <laughs> Got me. It's as if you haven't heard me ask this question. I know. I <laughs> dozens of times. For this. I didn't even plan for this. Who would I want to shadow for a day? Oh, Farouz. There you go. Okay, there you go. That's. Wouldn't that be crazy? I mean, oh God. Yeah, I'd like to be backstage or something. Yeah, well, I, um, I appreciate I appreciate you tremendously for doing this. Um, people can find tons of information about you and your work online. Um, just search uh, Marianne Peters. Uh, and thank you also for being such an active member in the African community. It's uh, it's been a, a pleasure having you part of the community. Well, it's, I have huge gratitude for all that you're doing with these podcasts. And um, there's so many talented people out there. Oh, my God. I just, I'm kind of in awe. So I appreciate being included. It's really kind of you. Thanks so much. Thanks.